Ah, yes. Yes, good evening to all. Welcome to Mysore Global Forum. Mysore Global Forum is an international weekly panel discussion jointly organized by the Department of International Relations and the BRICS Institute India to promote the students and enhance their knowledge to understand about the global issues, what is going on uh, surrounding us and how India is balancing the relations with uh, other countries and Indian diplomacy and moreover, uh, many issues which are happening in the international community. And uh, in, under this platform, uh, we had uh, discussions on Russia-Ukraine crisis uh, in uh, a different perspective, like how India looks Russia-Ukraine crisis and how India is balancing what is the Indian diplomacy and how China, uh, it will look into Russia, China, Russia and the Ukraine crisis. And also maritime issues also, we had a uh, discussion under this uh, platform, sir. And uh, this is my uh, very pleasure to invite you, sir, uh, to welcome to our forum. And also today, we have a uh, Brigadier uh, Vivek Anand, uh, senior fellow, uh, VIF, to discuss more about Chinese investment uh, in South Asia, how it is uh, destabilizing uh, the South Asian countries, and also what is the Chinese influence how China is rising its influence in South Asia. Now, many countries we know Sri Lanka is there, Afghanistan is there, and uh, you know, Nepal is there, Pakistan is there. With the, under the BRI and so many projects, how China is trying to destabilizing the South Asian countries and how best India can control the Chinese influence in South Asia. I hope students will be enlightened, students will be benefit by this discussion. Sir, it is my great pleasure to welcome to you for our uh, panel discussion, sir. I hope uh, you will enlighten our student. And hearty welcome to uh, panel discussion, sir. Today, we also have uh, Professor Anant Padumnav, uh, Director, School of Engineering, University of Mysore, and Madam Dr. Janavi, uh, from Karnataka State Open University, sir, to have an, uh, uh, discussions on the, this uh, uh, panel, sir. And it is a great pleasure to me to welcome uh, these eminent scholars for our forum. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. You are most welcome to our panel discussion. We also have professors and uh, you know delegates and students to discuss about the Chinese investment and uh, you know how it is uh, destabilizing uh, South Asian countries. And moreover, sir, it is my great immense pleasure. It is my honor to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Binod Singh, Director BRICS Institute India, uh, for his constant support. And he is a co-organizer for Mysore Global Forum, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Binod, you are most welcome to our panel discussion, sir. And uh, Without having, without taking much time, I will leave the platform to Dr. Binod to continue the discussion, sir. Thank you, sir. So good Dr. evening. Yes, yes, good evening. And uh, Jai Hind. And uh, first of all, it's an honor that today we can host uh, one of India's senior most uh, scholar on China. I mean, China's role in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, but I would like to explain a little bit background that uh, the speaker today, Brigadier Vinod Anand sir, he didn't believe in speaking too much. And that's why he was interested by VIF to host more than 60 foreign uh, heads of the missions and delegates to brief them on India's foreign policy. So the less said is well said. That's what uh, Brigadier has been practicing. And today in our this uh, online we can say virtual classroom, which we call Master Global Forum for our students and for our colleagues in different part of the university. It's a pleasure that uh, Brigadier has uh, agreed, despite his busy schedule for the last two, three days, 
uh, in Delhi, which is the capital of India. And the kind of visits we have from different foreign ministers of the world, European nations, and we had Russian forums. It's really uh, on, the, on the behalf of the BRICS Institute and behalf of Mysore University, sir, we are very indebted to you that uh, you accepted this uh, invitation on a very short notice to address us and guide us on the very uh, hot topic for the IR students. The topic is already, it's, it looks like it's already concluded that Chinese money or Chinese uh, investment in South Asia or the larger region has been getting now, I mean, proving to be destabilizing more than stabilizing. But we are not going to take this uh, foregone conclusion right now. And uh, since we are starting this conference, so the topic is quite open and we can take the both side of the understanding how Chinese money or Chinese capital is helpful for some countries in South Asia, where India is not able to play a, and not being allowed to play active roles. For example, in Pakistan or say in Afghanistan, uh, we have some issues of you know, connectivity. So even though we want to help Afghanistan, we are being denied. So is Chinese capital or Chinese involvement is proving to be a, a stabilizing factor for that region, which is good for India. So instead of going for the conclusion in our topic today, I apologize that uh, we are still open to debate that the Chinese capital or the Chinese money in this part of the world is still debatable. We cannot go for the conclusion as many of the students, many of the companies from India and many of the business from India, they are involved with the Chinese in different sector, whether it is Paytm, financial sector and different sector. But at the same time, as a moderator of this discussion, I would like to mention a few decisions today, what happened in the world. Canada has rejected the Huawei and JT as the part of Canada's 5G revolution. And today IIT Madras has successfully tested the first 5G call and digitally developed all the operations and network. So it's a great day for Indian science. And uh, we are trying to prove ourselves that we can do without Chinese technology, without Chinese Huawei and JTE. And same thing we are looking forward to doing the electronics like phones. But at the same time, being in Delhi, uh, we get disturbed by some news that um, 500 SIM cards, so 5,000 SIM cards has been found in Manipur or in Nepal or in Bangladesh, where the Chinese guys are operating some kind of uh, smart money or easy money or loan schemes which has led to some death of suicides of Indian people who have borrowed money on the Chinese apps. Again, uh, some news, disturbing news are from Ladakh and sometimes from Bombay, that our power transmission channels has been affected by Chinese cyber attack. So there are a lot of issues which we cannot discuss in such a short time, but we decided to contact someone who is at the core of India's China policy making, that is VIF, and he can guide us whether we should be alarmed we should be careful when we take a Chinese scholarship to go and study in China or a Chinese startup company getting a fund from China to develop itself. So, sir, I think without further delay, um, and also like I, I just forgot to mention that I've been under uh, Brigadier Binodanan guidance for more than I think a decade now when he visited my university, Beijing Foreign Studies University. And uh, he's one of the veteran at VIF since his establishment. So given this all background, we request Brigadier Sir to guide us where to be careful while dealing with Chinese companies in India and around, around India, sir. So sir, thank you for your time. We welcome you again. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And uh, I'm very happy, rather very glad to share my thoughts on uh, what China is doing in South Asia, what its uh, implications are, and uh, uh, how do we deal or how are we dealing with it? So this is a subject which is uh, very vast and uh, it may not be possible to cover in detail all the uh, South Asian countries where China has uh, extended uh, its uh, influence in a very uh, inordinate uh, way, which is definitely very concerning uh, for India. 
So China uh, uh, has uh, quoted this uh, BRI uh, with the effect from rather than 2013, but that does not mean that it was not uh, involved in uh, uh, connectivity projects and such projects uh, even in two, before 2013. So there are a uh, uh, number of uh, factors which uh, compelled China or which uh, motivated China and its leadership uh, to promote this uh, Belt and uh, Road Initiative. Uh, this was announced first in uh, uh, 2013 in the uh, Central Asian country of Kazakhstan. And uh, later on, a paper was also issued by the National uh, De Development Research Commission of China, which is equivalent to the Australian Planning Commission of India and now the Niti Ayo. So they had issued a policy paper, which was uh, uh, titled uh, Vision and Actions in uh, Jointly Building Silk Road economic belt and 21st century maritime silk road. So this was done in 2015. And uh, later on, uh, the Chinese leadership, they held two belt and road, uh, road uh, initiative forums in 2017 and uh, later in 2019. So these, uh, these forums, uh, more than about 130 countries attended uh, uh, this, these forums and uh, they were very much impressed with uh, what the Chinese had outlined. Uh, there were good about six to seven corridors they were talking about. They were talking about uh, Central Asian uh, corridor linking uh, China to uh, Europe. Uh, they were talking about uh, the China-Pakistan uh, economic corridor and uh, China, rather BCIM, but uh, which of course uh, has not been materialized. But then it was uh, the China-Myanmar economic corridor uh, that has materialized. There was a China uh, penin peninsular uh, corridor that is linking uh, the mainland Asian countries and the, of course, the uh, other Asian countries uh, with China. And uh, there was this 21st century maritime silk road, uh, which linked a number of uh, countries in the Indian Ocean to East Asia. That included even uh, ports in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, uh, in West Asia and the Eastern coast of Africa. Uh, later on, they even progressed to uh, pol uh, polar silk road, that is the uh, route uh, which one is talking about uh, from China, Russia to the, I mean, that was the Ar Arctic uh, silk road or uh, silk. So this was, uh, this was, uh, uh, vast, uh, very big uh, initiative. And uh, in 2017, they had talked about uh, spending a good about $890 billion worth of uh, money to promote this initiative. They've gone as far as you, you in, uh, met in America. Uh, so this was a grand uh, plan and uh, it is still a grand plan. Uh, uh, maybe some of it has been realized and other uh, rest is in work, but then there have been many uh, problems which China has encountered because of its policies, uh, because of the way it has gone about uh, realizing the objectives of the uh, this uh, one belt, one road or Belt and Road Initiative. And at one time it was also called uh, Silk Economical, uh, S-E-R-B, Silk uh, Economic Road. And some uh, 
I'm not remember the exact uh, but anyway, so they had this uh, grant project. Uh, and there were many domestic and uh, external factors uh, that uh, motivated uh, China to go in this, basically because uh, they wanted to utilize the surplus capacities of their, uh, they had money, capital, they, they had labor. Uh, most of the infrastructure projects uh, in China were complete. They had the skill, and that is what they wanted to utilize uh, uh, these kind of capacities and continue to grow because uh, they didn't want to go into recession. And at the uh, external level or uh, at the foreign uh, and foreign and security policy level, they also realized that this was a, a good bet because uh, the, they wanted to stabilize their uh, periphery by promoting development and uh, authorizing the, the uh, peripheral provinces uh, to uh, take part in the development of the adjoining uh, countries, uh, promote uh, connectivity. Uh, as also, there was this uh, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, China dream. So he wanted to rejuvenate uh, China. And at the external level, there was the question of, uh, at that time, this was uh, prevented. The American and Americans are doing a rebalancing in uh, Asia Pacific. So they wanted, uh, Chinese wanted to promote their own economic. Uh, and there's strategic uh, alternatives. So there are a number of uh, uh, economic and uh, strategic reasons which compelled uh, or motivated uh, China to go in for this. So now I will very briefly touch on the uh, some of these uh, initiators in uh, India's neighborhood. As we are aware that uh, now, Sri Lanka is uh, undergoing both uh, political and economic crisis. Uh, there is a stability in uh, Pakistan also because of uh, a number of factors. Uh, and uh, one factor, of course, is uh, the uh, stability caused by some of the insurgents uh, protesting against uh, the investment of uh, Chinese in say Balochistan. Uh, so let's first take uh, the case of uh, perhaps uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, maybe uh, after Sri Lanka, something on Pakistan, and then I'll also devote some time uh, on uh, Nepal uh, and Bangladesh. And let me see if there is any time uh, left for others. But, uh, so that's uh, the, in uh, Sri Lanka, I will put across uh, a few points. Uh, as we are aware, uh, Sri Lanka is uh, struggling to cope with the uh, uh, serious uh, economic crisis with the inflation, soaring food and fuel shortages, and uh, the fears of uh, default on sovereign uh, uh, Right. So then the, the so in all this, China is only a contributory factor because Sri Lanka had uh, these kind of uh, uh, problems uh, due to several other factors also uh, because of some of the policies which are uh, uh, not good for uh, China, uh, sorry, for the uh, for Sri Lanka. And uh, so I will do more time on what China did in uh, Sri Lanka and less time on the contribution by Sri Lanka itself. So as you are aware, uh, one of the uh, projects which, I, which, is, uh, uh, which has caused a lot of problems for Sri Lanka was the Hambantota 
project where uh, now China has uh, China has got the lease for 99 years. Now, this Samantota project didn't contribute to uh, China uh, to, 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 to the Sri Lanka's uh, economy. Uh, and because it was uh, just a uh, hometown of uh, the Rajapaksa family, which has been uh, ruling uh, Sri Lanka. So that uh, Rajapaksa family, which has been uh, ruling for a number of years, caused, uh, I mean, this uh, problem. As far as China is concerned, they've been, uh, for them, it is a strategic investment. So even if they had lost, uh, lost uh, money, it does not matter to them. And there, are, there is a Hamman Tuta airport. There also, uh, there is hardly, I think, one flight comes. Uh, so it was a losing proposition. And uh, recently, there is uh, also the project of uh, Port City of Colombo, uh, which the, the Rajapaksa family wanted to make. Uh, something like uh, Dubai or Singapore. So there also, all these investments have contributed greatly to the present uh, uh, economic woes of uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, they have also therefore contributed to the, uh, uh, the, the instability, the political and economic stability in a way. Uh, but, uh, but then uh, one really can't blame Chinese for all the economic problems there. Uh, and India has been willing to support uh, Sri Lanka. And in fact, so far, uh, India has been able to give more, uh, about $6 billion total as, uh, as a letter of credits or in many kind of shape, uh, shapes in the, in the sense that uh, uh, it's uh, also encouraging IMF uh, to support Sri Lanka in its uh, crisis. But China surprisingly has not uh, come in uh, to uh, support uh, Sri Lanka. It, uh, it just don't want to reschedule the loans and uh, they want only to restructure finance. But what Sri Lanka is looking for is uh, uh, something which uh, Chinese Despite the fact that they are interested in Sri Lanka, they will not be able to get So I leave Sri Lanka there, though so one can you see, speak from this uh, a lot of time because each country deserves uh, at least one session on this. Uh, the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor uh, for, uh, for China, it is just a strategic investment. Uh, it started with the uh, fact uh, with an amount of $62 billion, which was later reduced to $46 uh, billion. And I think uh, only a portion of this uh, has been dispersed. And it's uh, causing a lot of uh, issues in the uh, big thing, uh, in the initial stages, the uh, four provinces of uh, Pakistan, they were at, uh, they were wanting to get a piece of the action. Uh, and uh, there was some problem. The, uh, the, this, the last government of Imran Khan, which has uh, now gone away, they had found a number of uh, problems in the uh, China Pakistan economic corridor related to the lack of transparency uh, and of capacity in uh, the Chinese uh, loans or debt which they had given. And uh, it was not uh, readily known uh, as to the terms and conditions they were uh, given to various entities. And uh, recently, uh, there were also some media reports that uh, Chinese power companies, they have not been paid uh, money by the, uh, the, the, the Pakistani entities. Uh, so there's, there is a lot of issue on that. 
And this is compounded by the fact that uh, uh, the Balochistan insurgency, insurgency is there and their uh, main project in Gavadar, I think it's coming under uh, uh, attack by the Balochistan Liberation Army. Uh, I think a few days uh, or week back, there was an attack uh, in, in, uh, on the Confucius Center in Karachi, where uh, some uh, uh, some teachers, uh, Chinese, uh, were killed. And uh, after that, also, there was uh, some attack in uh, Karachi or somewhere else. But so there have been a number of attacks. And maybe, and, and I think over a dozen or maybe even more than that, Chinese have been killed. So Chinese are uh, apprehensive and the this is all, all uh, and the stability is not only confined to say uh, uh, sound because um, it's even in the uh, Gilgit Baltistan uh, area where it uh, there were, this kind of uh, instability does not come to notice, but uh, because of uh, 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 now the, the Chinese. Uh, have also extended, I believe, some loan to the construction of Basha Dam, uh, which is on the uh, border of Gilgit, but uh, Baltistan and uh, the Pakhtun Khwa province of Pakistan. Uh, so, and India, of course, uh, does, uh, India is very, very uh, concerned because uh, the sovereignty of India is affected. And China has, of course, double standards in this because a uh, long time back in 2009, when India wanted to uh, develop a uh, uh, hydropower dam in Arunachal Pradesh uh, by taking loan from Asian Development Bank, uh, China on the border directors uh, uh, had stepped up and said that uh, this should not be given. Uh, and because it is a disputed area between China and India. Um, but the same thing applies to Gilgit uh, Baltistan or uh, the area through which CPEC uh, passes. So these uh, uh, kind of uh, actions, it is, uh, uh, I think they create uh, problems uh, on the bilateral relationship, not only between India and Pakistan, but India and China. So CPEC uh, is a project which India definitely does not uh, support. Uh, so these are two uh, countries where the Chinese contribution has created problems. But on the other hand, even in Nepal, now that the Present uh, government, uh, which is uh, of Prime Minister Dioba, is there, and the communists are in the background. They are very, very uh, careful in uh, promoting the uh, VRI. Uh, and China actually is not very much happy. Uh, don't, Nepal was, uh, you see, shown or uh, touted as a pillar of uh, the BRI uh, uh, initiative. Uh, but the implementation of uh, projects because of some reasons has been very, very uh, slow and sketchy. And uh, recently the Chinese uh, foreign minister Wang Yi was there, I think in uh, the in end of March and uh, uh, though the BRI plans were not discussed very much, uh, but it was clear that uh, there is uh, apprehension amongst the, uh, the Nepalese uh, policymakers regarding uh, uh, what are regarding what can uh, be said as the uh, China's strategic designs uh, in uh, Nepal. I mean. The communist government was uh, better <coughs> disposed to China. Uh, so what Nepalese are looking for are the soft concessional loans, uh, 
uh, they they want that uh, the project the, the interest rate should not be uh, more they should be 2% now these are the rates of uh, i and uh, imf uh, because imf gives uh, loans uh, the rates uh, between 1 to 3% chinese loans are much uh, costier 5 to 7% because they are given without much conditions at that time um, and the terms and conditions uh, remain hidden. And the, as you are aware, in South Asia, the political elites are very corrupt, and uh, the Chinese try to buy them out. And therefore, uh, at a later stage, uh, the, in, the, the, the South Asian political parties blame the previous government or the previous leadership. Uh, meanwhile, they would have made the money. So that uh, is another issue. Uh, this is common to South Asia. And the Nepalese wanted that the BRI uh, project should not be exclusively given to the uh, Chinese companies. Uh, rest of the companies uh, other than the Chinese should also participate. So that is a level uh, playing field in which uh, Chinese are not uh, trying to see exceed to uh, and then uh, you also said that there should not be any political strings attached meaning the i mean they, they shouldn't have any implication for the political parties that is the opposite or ruling party uh, <laughs> but the Chinese also believe that the project implementation by the uh, uh, the Nepalese the has been slow. In fact, uh, Nepalese have been also uh, very, very careful in taking large loans. And recently, as the Prime Minister, uh, we had also gone to Lumbani. A long time back, there was a project uh, uh, which was uh, a Chinese project uh, earmarked uh, for Lumbini, developing of the uh, Lumbini airport and other uh, infrastructure there for uh, uh, tourism. So that was very attractive for Nepal. Uh, but then basically, if you look at Nepal, unless uh, India joins uh, in the BRI, uh, there is no way that uh, these projects uh, which pass through Nepal or uh, connect Nepal to China through Tibet, they are going to be any use either to uh, China or to, to, to Nepal. And India is opposed to joining BRI. So therefore, the I think both from the Chinese side, uh, there has been uh, delay in implementation and uh, and I will say Nepalis have been also very, very careful in uh, implementing the, or, or going ahead. And, uh, there was a, a recently also a project uh, in, uh, approved by Nepalese parliament on the Millennium Challenge uh, Corporation Fund, which is of uh, US. And uh, this, this was uh, approved by the parliament because now the uh, non-communist government is there. Uh, the, the Chinese had objected to this because the, that caused uh, perhaps the heartburn uh, on the Chinese and that maybe showed that the Nepalese are now veering away from, uh, from China. Uh, so there are, Few more points about Nepal, Nepal, but I will leave it at that uh, and quickly, I think, come to uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh uh, uh, is, is also an uh, important part of uh, the BRI project of, uh, uh, of, of China, and, and uh, they had, uh, I think, uh, a whole lot of projects uh, planned for uh, Bangladesh because in 2016, uh, President Xi Jinping had visited uh, uh, Bangladesh and there were uh, uh, 
and that was a visit after 30 years uh, to Bangladesh and the, the, the 2016 projects, uh, uh, the, the 2016 year, uh, in 2016, there were $26 billion worth of uh, uh, projects uh, planned uh, under the BRI and uh, $14 billion as a joint project. And therefore, the total was $40 billion. But uh, here, Bangladesh, again, was very, very circumspect. They had uh, attended both the 2015 and 2017, 2017 and 2019 uh, Belt uh, and Road Forum in Beijing. And why they accepted a number of things that actually uh, the, 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 these projects have not uh, uh, realized uh, because Bangladesh was also quite concerned. And uh, there was a, a port which was to be developed uh, by the name of Sunadia. And that was, uh, that project was canceled and that Sunadia was uh, going to link to be part of the Bangladesh, uh, India, China, Myanmar, Canada. Uh, so there also, the as of now, uh, very few projects have come. Uh, there are uh, uh, some projects with, uh, like friendship bridges, uh, but that's a very limited expenditure on that. And uh, the total, uh, amount owed uh, our Chinese debt in Bangladesh is about uh, $8 billion. $8 billion uh, is okay for Bangladesh because uh, it, this is the amount of salary of the government uh, servants. And Bangladesh has uh, managed its uh, economy very well. Uh, it's become an ex export uh, uh, nation it supports a lot. Uh, though it has got a lot of uh, connections with China and then getting the uh, some of the defense equipment, uh, but the present government is uh, very, uh, uh, very careful of uh, keeping India's security interests in mind while, uh, of course, uh, strengthening its uh, relationship with China uh, because there is certain section of uh, Bangladesh uh, intellectuals who believe that uh, uh, with the some problems occurring in China's economy because of the US sanctions and because of any other issues, a lot of uh, supply chains might pass through Bangladesh and give uh, further fillet to the Bangladesh economy. Uh, so I leave Bangladesh there uh, and very briefly mention uh, China, uh, Myanmar Economic Corridor before I close. Uh, China, uh, Myanmar Economic Corridor is... A little bit on Afghanistan also, a few lines on Afghanistan. Okay, okay. So China, uh, Myanmar Economic Corridor, uh, well, uh, uh, that's... Uh, uh, that's again an important corridor and especially when the BCIM has not uh, come up, it gives access to the uh, uh, Indian Ocean uh, and Bay of Bengal and solves uh, China's Malacca dilemma. Uh, but here also, uh, I have a list of Myanmar projects that I will not uh, uh, go into that. We can have a separate uh, thing. The, there also the Manamaris have been quite careful in uh, expanding the scope of uh, this uh, cement. In fact, uh, the Chakfu uh, uh, port, which was uh, going to be developed at about uh, $9 billion or so, that was drastically reduced to $1.6 billion. So there are a whole lot of projects uh, a, one of the earlier projects of Mike Swan Dam was uh, cancelled even before uh, Aung San Suu Kyi came to power. Uh, so 
even though Myanmar military is obliged to China in many ways, uh, it is careful in taking taking these kind of uh, uh, loans, which will put it to, to I mean, will affect its uh, economy, because. You see, the, 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 what Chinese did in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, that is the Hamar Tota, uh, that resonates, uh, that, that resonated very well across uh, not only South Asia, in Africa and uh, Central Asia, because the countries in Central Asia like Pakistan, uh, which have had uh, uh, problems on this issue. Well, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, uh, Taliban has been uh, very well disposed to uh, China's approach on the issue. They, 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 they want to extend the CPEC to Afghanistan. Uh, it, the Chinese are interested in the uh, mineral wealth and some of these strategic uh, elements, uh, rare earth elements, which are there in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and, and, that China is also encouraging some of these Central Asian countries to have uh, uh, rail linkages uh, uh, from uh, Central Asia to Afghanistan. Uh, but they are also concerned with the, the uh, instability that is there, not only because of the Taliban. Taliban is the major contributor, of course. It's not been recognized by uh, I don't think any country has uh, recognized, even though China uh, and uh, some of the Central Asian countries and even Russia, they do have uh, embassies. Uh, even uh, uh, I think India is uh, also sending its staff, but not. Uh, but so that they have not got the recognition. But China, China is concerned about the uh, Uyghurs' problem, and uh, they wouldn't like to have uh, uh, issue from uh, Taliban on that uh, aspect. So the, the, the effort, uh, I mean, the Chinese are interested, but they are also very much careful about the uh, instability of Tali Taliban, Taliban government of the ISKP and some of the other uh, groups like IMU and a whole lot of such uh, unsavory characters uh, in Afghanistan. So I'll leave Afghanistan there, and uh, perhaps I'll close it here and take question and answer yeah. as well. or, or maybe we discuss or the others uh, could say we will say something and then we can. Yeah. So thank you so much. Basically, we just wanted this kind of uh, a snap view of direction of how the Chinese projects or the policies of BRI are working in our neighborhood. And um, you, the great thing was that, sir, even uh, uh, you covered most of the interesting countries which we expected from you, uh, although we didn't provide you in advance. So, sir, um, we do have questions lined up, uh, but we also have some uh, colleagues from different departments. Yeah, they're also interested in China and what's happening in this neighborhood. So before I pass on the question, uh, time to the, my students there, I would like to invite uh, Professor Padmanabhan if he's listening to us. Sir, uh, thank you for joining our forum, Meso Global Forum. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hope the microphone has been given to you. So basically, sir, the kind of infrastructure we are developing in India, uh, you can see there's a lot of input from China, uh, whether it is our metro rails or some power transmission lines, or every day we see in the newspaper that uh, the Ch this project has been given to a Chinese company. Uh, what could be the main reason, sir? Do we really cannot do without Chinese technology or even Chinese uh, capital? I would like your input on, on the presentation why in different part of the South Asia, Central Asia and ASEAN countries, Chinese money or Chinese technology and Chinese companies has become kind of indispensable despite their failing, despite we have situation in Sri Lanka and in Pakistan, still, they will welcome Chinese company and Chinese you know, uh, fund to come and invest. And at the same time, India is a little bit compelled to give money to, to our neighbors to Nepal. So these small countries have bargaining power that look, India, if you are not supporting on this project, I will go to China. We will go to another country. 
So in this process, sir, I see our new foreign minister. He has committed, even our prime minister, both Mr. Wan Gohamin, they have committed more funds than in the past for development assistance to countries like Nepal. As Brigadier Sir mentioned that in Nepal, long back in 2003, the Chinese came out with the plan of developing Lumbini with 3 billion US dollar for the whole new airport and tourist corridor and hotels. I don't know where is that project. Similarly, where I'm sitting right now in Gurgaon, they had come out with you know, 10 billion projects, 5 billion projects to develop new cities. And they had acquired lands in Sona. And I don't know where is that project. I was a little bit involved in that project. And I thought of, you know, that was not part of VRI. That was part of bilateral, you know, the way India and China were going ahead. So Professor Padmanabhan, uh, would you like to share your insight on why we need China in South Asia? Or we don't need, or we need in what way? Thank you, sir. Yes. Sir, anyway, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, giving me an opportunity to involve in this discussion. First of all, I am basically a technical man, technically involved in uh, all our engineering aspects. As you put in, I am in power systems. Power system, electrical power systems, wherein we could see some of the major uh, developments in Karnataka, Karnataka, which is in India. Karnataka is one of the state wherein uh, everything, almost all the operation has been made automatic. See, you also mentioned about the cyber attack uh, in uh, electrical power system, which is not to certain extent easy to do that. But anyway, as I said, Chinese uh, technicians or engineers are quite capable of uh, destroying our electrical system. As far as the investment, other things are concerned, I am not much aware of these investments because Karnataka is quite sufficient to generate electricity up to 20, 25 megawatts of electrical power generation in Karnataka and they are uh, selling that to other uh, system also. And the development of uh, the you know, automation is in such a way that uh, it is not easy to have a cyber attack here. And uh, uh, I heard that uh, in uh, Bombay, that uh, uh, Western uh, uh, electricity power uh, supply. And also before that, I can say that uh, recently, the India has been made one frequency, one nation electrical system. See, all electrical power systems was connected to one frequency. And also it is possible for us to go from uh, Karnataka to your Delhi or to uh, Northern uh, states, any other Eastern states or wherever possible. So this is the uh, finest thing that has been happened in the recent days as far as the electrical system is concerned. For the projects, as I said, I don't know how far the Chinese are investing, but it is very dangerous to invite them to invite here. For two good reasons. One, there may be a, a betraying act or a, 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 an act wherein a cyber can attack most of the parts. In 2012, we had a blackout in almost all 50% of Karnataka in India, wherein it is because of the technical reason. Some people also say that it's because of cyber attack. And recently, in two or three years back, there was a cyber attack uh, called in the Western region in Maharashtra and other things. So as far as the inv invitation for these people are concerned, so let, I don't know exactly, but I can presume that it is for the infrastructure development and development of uh, the system, but not for the operation and control of the system. When we talk about the operation and control of the system, it should be our, our system only. Our PhD students are working on cyber security in electrical power systems. There's a cyber security forum in uh, India which is looking after many things. And uh, uh, the investment in terms of non-conventional energy resources, maybe some companies are in, but Adani and other groups are doing very well in India and abroad. So it is possible for us, for our government to see that all controlling action is done by our people only, not given to any other company, only the construction part may be there. But uh, 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 other things, uh, I'm a little bit aware, I'm not aware of what is the project, how much uh, investment is there, what is that is going to happen. But I can really certainly say that as a director of uh, engineering college, and a part of electrical power systems, we are self-sufficient in maintaining our system. So it is uh, not required to invite any country, we can give back to any other country. Uh, this is what my uh, so opinion about the 
a follow up question from me if you allow me will be are we in a position to help uh, countries in south asia like nepal uh, sri lanka sir. for their power generation definitely we are having the electrical systems connected to pakistan bangladesh nepal and other things so since we are pioneer in developing an automated electrical system as of now when you go back to 10 years uh, uh, down the line back we were not in a position to have a, 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 you know gas insulated substation substation in karnataka but now we are having the gas insulated substation two in karnataka that is the technology advancement in such a way that we can certainly go and give electrical power not just the electrical power all the technology which is there which is advanced in electrical system so that we can have electrical connectivity with the neighbor uh, countries nepal burma or bangladesh or pakistan or to certain extent lanka also through cable and it is possible for us to dominate as far as the other aspects of electrical system is concerned we need not depend upon any other country as a matter of fact so we are very much advanced in automated electrical system as of now because one nation one frequency and one automation all right sir so i'll close this part of discussion here but with one final comment from my side that i will take your comment as theoretically not practically because more than 100 of my colleagues who speak chinese they work for chinese power companies who have offices in gurgaon and delhi and different part of india and they have factories in gujarat they call it tvea and they have been supplying most of power power generation equipments which is up super ultrasonic up to date so the chinese involvement in power sector of india for the last 10 years 15 years has been a kind of i have been a part of that thing whether it's reliance or adani or any company you know the at the higher level the deal has been made with china and uh, we are not able to you know discuss all the detail here so theoretically i take that my engineering school is very famous all over the world but practically i think we have been uh, still dependent upon chinese equipments for our power system totally agree with that we are depending on many things on china but let let us claim that the people are very intelligent in operating and maintenance of the system as of now let us purchase that try to operate ourselves try to modify that try to operate and try to be independent of their control so we look forward for your guidance in writing a you know research in paper on this sector that how power sector of india can really be a kind of a foreign policy you know of india in south asia that's why chinese are involved in south asia if we are helping nepal and and sri lanka in this sector i think Chinese will run out for their business. Their manpower is costly. They are coming here. Their safety is an issue. They are being being killed in you know Balochistan, Pakistan, Nepal, different part of India. So Chinese people are scared to come this part, and they cannot tolerate the heat we have when they yeah. come to India and Mysore and different part of India. It's very hot. We cannot work here. So India is naturally destined, geographically destined, to be a major economic foreign policy player in South Asia. and that's what our keynote speaker today was trying to say that chinese projects have come for the first time in such a large way but success ratio has been very limited uh, with permission of bharti madam i would like to give one minute to uh, our another discussant madam janvi she has been teaching uh, students about law different kind of law especially the law, land law and when i started my china studies journey the very first topic we were comparing between india and china is that in china government can acquire land for any project at any time and can remove people on a short notice in india land acquisition was one of the biggest issue which was holding us back for a long time now today in discussion why bri project of china is getting into trouble in different part of south asia i think uh, brigadier vinod anand sir said very clearly that most of the countries in south asia are corrupt all politicians are corrupt so the conditions they are shining to take money whether it is on the high rate than imf loans or the project implementation or the security or even as he mentioned that the project is going only to chinese companies chinese laborers they are not employing the local laborers in those countries so what is the i mean benefit to the local economy is being questioned even by pakistani politicians in opposition and different part of the world so ma'am janvi would you like to tell us in brief that if projects like bris are coming in south asia in different part of sri lanka pakistan nepal do you think that land issue i mean chinese are not playing by the uh, local law they are evading the law by corrupting the politicians if suppose it if, if it is a world bank project 
I am a project, you know, if it is a project from US ad, you know, or from India, we do follow all the environmental issues, all the conditions, but when the project goes to Chinese, I think in, in, in a rush to complete the project in short time, they do neglect the environmental aspect of the, you know, project. Would you like to comment on this, ma'am? Definitely, definitely, sir. What you said that it is land acquisition is a very difficult in India because uh, all laws uh, based on their uh, culture. Because overnight we cannot uh, make, uh, we cannot change the law. So what the culture? That's uh, all on the basis of a cultural process we make the law. So likewise here the judicial process like this, uh, and uh, because up to Supreme Court we have, we can reach against the acquisition of a laws. So it is a very difficult task in compared to China in India acquisition of a uh, property. But even though, however, it's a one side is a. The process of acquisition is going on, that is a one side, but acquisition process is over, only recording the compensation and whatever that the cases are going on. But uh, acquisition itself, it is not a difficult task nowadays. They can acquire and uh, they can uh, uh, create any uh, multi corporations, uh, companies like that. Uh, that is not in uh, nowadays, that is not an easy, uh, a tough task uh, compared to the earlier days. Uh, because in those days, it is property right is come under the fundamental right uh, under article 19 1f in those days it was very difficult to acquisition process but nowadays it is not a uh, tough job and what you said that is uh, it is a politicians politics and corruptions these are all uh, biggest issues that is correct sir it is here the biggest because uh, once we notified the area or it is the project is uh, uh, initiated or start before started any project so what they do here the political uh, people or uh, those who are uh, having a muscle power or money power they purchase the property or they can create the agreement with the people local people then they will sell it to the government in a higher prices actual uh, owner or real owner of the property will get a lower money. These are all uh, uh, political games and economic offenses going on. It is not it is not uh, uh, easy to control here because the population is the main reason compared to any yes. others. We appreciate your comment, ma'am, and uh, we look forward for some more studies on this aspect of uh, development in South Asia. Now we are moving to the question and answer part. I mean. Uh, we cannot hold our speaker for a long time. Uh, we apologize for that. So, Pinel, are you ready? The very first question goes to one of our MA student at University of Mashor. Her name is Pinel, and she is very much interested in China and South Asia. So, the floor is yours, Pinel. Please uh, direct your question to a speaker. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Pinel Trivedi, and I'm currently pursuing my MA in International Relations from Maharaja's College, University of Mysore. First of all, thank you, sir, for being here and guiding us. Um, my question to you is, will China's enduring trade surplus with major South Asian economies contribute to the region's deindustrialization? Yeah. The question is to speaker, sir. Brigadier, sir. Yeah, that's... Uh... Very tough question. <laughs> Whether uh, uh, it will contribute, the, the, the surplus will contribute to the e industrialization. That is the question, I hope. Uh, shall I repeat, sir? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, will China's enduring trade surplus with major South Asian economies contribute to the region's de industrialization? De industrialization. Okay. No, no, I, uh, I mean, yes, it's a question, but then you see what's happening is don't only look at uh, South Asia. Uh, China has got a trade surplus in almost every country, uh, including the US, uh, and a very large trade surplus. Uh, the only country with, or uh, only it has, only few countries with, it, with uh, whom it does not have a trade surplus, and that is, I think, Germany. Uh, Germany is exporting uh, more to China. But you see, this has not led to 
say deindustrialization of uh, america no one could say yes uh, the manufacturing industry has moved away from america uh, on the other hand uh, what will happen is that with this large surplus uh, the uh, uh, and the with growth of china uh, and uh, the, the labor is uh, getting uh, very uh, expensive in uh, China. And uh, some of these industries are already moving out, uh, not only because of the, 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 the expensive labor in China, but also because of uh, many other uh, related issues uh, like COVID-19. Uh, during this period, uh, a number of uh, supply chains were impacted and the, uh, some of the uh, foreign companies have moved out their uh, manufacturing uh, uh, plants uh, to say Vietnam, to some Southeast Asian countries, even to Bangladesh. And, uh, the, and India was also expecting uh, uh, some, uh, some kind of these uh, uh, benefits, which I think uh, uh, India has uh, received because though India is a, uh, surplus, uh, not a surplus, uh, the Indian trade uh, uh, overall has grown, including its exports have uh, grown uh, very substantially during the last two years. Uh, so I don't know how, I mean, maybe the, some economists might be able to answer this uh, difficult question, but I would like to believe that uh, uh, the uh, Chinese surplus uh, uh, may have some other uh, uh, concomitant uh, problems uh, for China uh, uh, because then, then the moment things get expenses in China, the, 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 the production moves out and that continues to happen. And therefore China has to move up in the uh, te uh, technology like what uh, America has been doing. Though America has uh, a lot of other uh, positives, it can print dollars and uh, there are no restrictions on that. And uh, that currency is accepted as uh, a universal currency by everyone. So it's acceptability is there. And Chinese currency is yet to be accepted. So there are many imponderables and they can, cannot be a, uh, the correct answer to what you have asked, but I can only give this limited answer to your uh, very profound question. Thank you, sir. So thank, you. so thank you so much. There's an online question from Nitish Raj on the in the chat box. He's asking that he, uh, the question is very much related to what uh, uh, Pinel asked today. Question is: Is China working on a one region, one money project? Is Chinese uh, are first promoting their currency in this part of the world with their BRI BRI project? Any comment on this, sir? I'm not sure about uh, one region and one money project, uh, meaning uh, utilizing uh, uh, Chinese yuan and uh, stock and debt is just uh, one step of the project of any region in this country. So, the question is not very clear, but what I yeah. understand is that he's promoting Chinese currency. Yeah. Promotion of China, yes, China would like to do that. Uh, at least, uh, and it's uh, worked, I think, on that. Uh, uh, but I think because China has got uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, currency reserves in uh, US dollars, so that also has uh, some kind of uh, impact on uh, China promoting its uh, currency. Uh, it, it is the acceptability of uh, Chinese yuan all over the uh, world, which might uh, perhaps uh, uh, help China, but I think that time is quite far away. In the time uh, the Americans are in the uh, permanent position, uh, the yuan is, yuan's use is going to be restricted. Uh, but then anything can happen because as the Russian Ukraine crisis show, mm. uh, during the beginning of uh, or the 
at the commencement of the conflict, the uh, ruble was uh, ruble had gone down, and when uh, the, when Putin said, "Okay, you pay me in rubles for the oil and gas which the even the Europeans were taking," uh, then the uh, Russian ruble climbed up. Now it's. Uh, value of ruble has gone up and its value has gone up more than it was before the commencement of crisis. 60, 68 something. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, so there is a certain uh, power in, uh, in, in uh, if, you are a, uh, if you are a country with uh, commodities, but then commodities can, uh, the, the prices can fluctuate very widely because of the uh, international circumstances. So this is, uh, again, I mean, one has to wait and watch, and one cannot say, yes, uh, China, China is definitely working on uh, making you on uh, uh, international currency, uh, um, like uh, maybe even euros or others, or hard currency, but then it has to change a number of its policies, uh, which, for, which may be too early to do this. Thank you very much, sir. I think we totally agree with you. And there's some, still some time that yuan will be accepted as well as euro and dollar. It will take some time. Uh, Mr. Alok, are you there? Can I, can we, the floor is yes. yours to ask the question to Brigadier, sir. Very good afternoon, sir. Sir, uh, thank you so much for uh, having this kind of panel discussion. <laughs> sir, uh, my, my name is Alok, sir. I'm second year student in IR department, University of Mysuru. Sir, my question is, how does Chinese influence in ASEAN? Well, ASEAN. China, China has got a you see, large, or you can say, uh, it has got, it has influenced ASEAN in many ways. So ASEAN talks about uh, its centrality, but uh, China has been able to drive a wedge in, uh, in Asian central, centrality uh, in its decision making. Uh, it has uh, adopted a policy of divide and uh, rule in uh, Asia. Uh, now, Laos and uh, Cambodia, they are firmly in the, on the side of China. And this year, uh, Cambodia is uh, uh, the the in the chair of uh, ASEAN so there's the period 2022 and uh, so this year is also uh, important for ASEAN because it's after uh, COVID and uh, ASEAN response to Ukraine crisis has also been uh, uh, some sort of divisive not uh, unified uh, not uh, very much uh, organized. On the other hand, one can say that uh, the ASEAN being uh, far away from uh, uh, European theater is not very much affected. So in a way it is affected because of the economic issues and some of these uh, strategic issues. Uh, so the, 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 the Chinese have been exerting a lot of influence on ASEAN. In South China Sea, uh, you would be aware of what's happening in South China Sea, expansion of uh, uh, China's influence of its uh, uh, island building or some activities. Uh, and uh, the countries that are affected are, of course, Vietnam, Indonesia, its disputes with the Philippines uh, uh, to an extent uh, uh, with the so, ASEANs are also very much uh, 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 I mean, affected by the economic uh, the, the relations which have with uh, China. They are in fact dependent upon China for uh, uh, their growth. Vietnam has a trade, both Vietnam and Malaysia trade with China uh, on uh, over hundred million dollars, almost the extent of uh, what uh, India has uh, with uh, with China, and uh, so they they are in a bind. 
because of the military and uh, economic muscle or heft which uh, China has, uh, these Asian countries uh, have to depend on uh, China. But at the strategic or security level, China is creating a lot of problems uh, and then this uh, increased its influence. That's why some of these uh, Asian countries, uh, they, they, they look up to India, Japan, to Australia, to, to the US, uh, to all policies, uh, which can uh, uh, reduce the influence of Chinese, or at least, uh, and, but they don't want also to uh, be part of any US-China contestation in the Indo-Pacific. So these, these are some of the very contentious issues uh, where the ASEAN has been, uh, I mean, the ASEAN has been trying to deal with, uh, but there's no perfect solution so far. Yeah, right. Of course, uh, the, if, you know, I can go ahead, but I'm... <laughs> The whole Central Asia, oh, ASEAN, you. South Asia, it oh, really needs you. to whole day, two day conference. I think, I think Madam Bharti, you should invite Brigadier Shed to Mysore. For a whole day conference. Sure, sir. <laughs> yes. We are, we are very happy to see Brigadier Sir in Mysore. I'll just finish. Two, I'll just finish two more questions. One is from Marin. Marin, are you there? Yes. Yes. Send me your question. Please ask your question quickly because we are running out of time a little bit. My name is Marin. Uh, I'm a student of international relations at the University of Mysore. First of all, I would like to thank you, Brigadier Vinod Anand, for such an uh, insightful talk you've given us today. Now I would like to continue with my question. Do you think China has become engine of growth in terms of technology for South Asia? Well, uh, it's engine of growth uh, not only for uh, South Asia, but uh, also for the rest of the world. See, sometime back, before or around 2008, we were talking about uh, India and China as the engine of growth in Asia. Uh, but China has still remained an engine of growth, though it's growth uh, uh, after COVID and its uh, restrictions uh, still going on with restrictions. The COVID restrictions still going on in uh, Shanghai. Uh, and and uh, and uh, Beijing, and uh, because there are other contributing factors, the growth has uh, come down to about four percent plus. Whereas uh, India's growth, uh, the forecast is uh, much better. Uh, some are indicating uh, about eight percent plus growth. Uh, so. India is the next uh, uh, growing power, and uh, it is expected uh, to be the third uh, uh, largest uh, economy in uh, all our terms. And um, maybe in the next uh, by about uh, at least 230. So that is the, so China has, uh, China is likely to reach what they promised on the middle, middle and income trap, uh, or it is, its uh, income uh, growth will reach a certain saturation point. Uh, beyond that, it uh, perhaps uh, uh, will not grow at even, uh, the growth will be less than 4%. Whereas India, because of several contributory factors like uh, I was reading also that in China, the, the by a certain time in 2040 or 50, the population of the old people will be uh, over 65 years will be much more, and uh, there'll be less uh, uh, working age population. Whereas India does not face this uh, demographical problem. Can you hear me? Can, she, yes, can you hear me? There was a disturbance, yeah, but we can hear very well, sir. Yeah, yeah. So there, there, there are many contributory factors in the uh, in the, the, the economic growth of India and, and China. So hopefully India will be doing much better. 
and uh, China's growth has come down. So, engine of growth, uh, I think India is also engine of growth, so not only for South Asia, but for Asia as well as uh, other uh, rest of the countries in the world. So that's why Prime Minister Modi has been talking about that if India grows, the world will also grow. That's the positive image. Uh, is. It's a great news for all of us, sir, as Indian economy is growing at the highest level. And we should be ready. That's why we are doing this conference, this seminar, that what is exact India's position and how we can you know, go out of India. Oh, yes, you, you see why uh, in, uh, in end of March, you see there were a lot of countries coming from Europe, talking, uh, they were coming not only from Europe, even the Chinese uh, uh, foreign minister was here in March in Guangxi before he went to Nepal, he came to India, before India, he was in Pakistan, uh, attending of course the OIC summit. And uh, a lot of Europeans heads of state came uh, in, in, in uh, India because they wanted, uh, they all rec are recognizing that India is the next uh, uh, engine of growth. Not that it was not earlier, but uh, it's an important engine of growth now. And uh, they want to trade and they want to secure, uh, uh, they want to interact with India on all the issues. Uh, the global issues or on global governance, uh, it is that perhaps is very short answer. But sir, I don't know how is the China studies is being affected now in India. We have one colleague from Kumar uh, KR Mangalam University. They have started a Chinese department in in Sohana Gurgaon. Uh, my colleague name is Raju Ranjan. He would like to say one question to you, sir. Raju, can you are you unmute? Can you speak? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Please. Please. Uh, sir, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really great. So my question is, uh, is again related to INA, because South Asia is uh, not only the land of facts, but also the land of perception, where the media widely, uh, like uh, they influence the people and people are influenced by each other, by the perception. So, and there is continuous discussion about India and China in this region and in Pakistan about India and uh, Pakistan. So I want to understand from you that in the battle of perception, where do you see uh, India coming ahead as we all are discussing uh, about the development of India? So coming ahead against China, because uh, in South Asia, India looks very helpless uh, in terms of uh, the, the perception of the, the, the people. Thank yes. you. Short. Thank you. Maybe uh, I will not uh, perhaps agree with that uh, premise that uh, India looks helpless. Yes, uh, uh, in the perception of uh, India or uh, the Indian media uh, may not be good. And that's only a certain section of the media. And uh, that section of media has a particular ideology. And that section of uh, media is also funded by some of the, the interests which are uh, inimical to the Indian uh, national interests. So India is a vast country, a diverse country, uh, uh, very uh, country where you have all kind of opinion and uh, I mean, India. If you have attended any international conference, the Indians are the one which ask, uh, who ask um, most questions in an international conference. Whereas <laughs> any other Asian, and they will keep quiet. They'll be yeah. silent, and they will listen more rather than uh, ask questions. But that is our that is our heritage, because. Uh, as you are aware, in uh, Mahabharata, in, in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna asked a whole lot of questions, and he, he was still not uh, convinced by uh, the by Shri Krishna. That's a, that's a, that's an uh, gene. Uh, but 
but i think the perception is changing i think the the perception is changing now a bit no no perception see the perception abroad is changing but even there there is a section on media international media in uh, america in the uk in some of these western countries in, in canada which uh, which takes an absolutely opposite uh, uh, view of india if you re, uh, read some of the reports they call india as a authoritarian state no? yeah. is india thought in authoritarian state china is not pakistan is not and it's uh, they are also calling it as some kind of a, a democracy limited democracy or partially free democracy or some such uh, or partially free media so these this, these are disinformation campaigns they are funded by some people who of course i know and a lot of people know uh, so it is up to you to get uh, either impressed or influenced by this or uh, i mean but i think it will be the, the more you read the more you study uh, and the more you go back to your roots uh, you will uh, realize that uh, india is doing Uh, well, compared to many other uh, countries yeah, in the region, compared to many other countries in the region, it's a very well convinced. Sir. It's a very biased world, and we have to speak for India. If we speak oh, more, yeah. I think they will try to change the perception. So please, all of uh, you, right? Uh, we have last two minutes. So we must. Karthik, are you there? Karthik, very young student of BA. Karthik, the floor is yours. Please, show your question. Karthik. Oh, unmute, unmute, please unmute, Karthik. But, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you for that enlightening session. I am Karthik K J, a political science student with University of Mysore. My question is in regard to the Blue Dot program or the initiative that the U S has floated. Up until now, China has invested more than nine hundred billion dollars in the Asian region, and it is expected to put in one point three trillion by twenty twenty seven. so how are we going to counter this and if we are to counter this can we do this as single entities or is it better we go in alliance on the quad platform should we join the blue dot initiative so uh, there is going to be uh, i think the quad summit is coming up and prime minister modi will travel to japan uh, to attend that and some of these issues might be discussed uh, there because blue dot initiative uh, as part of the indo pacific initiative or uh, quad i think this is a very small or meager amount for the connectivity projects and so i think uh, the 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 the, uh, the quad countries or quad plus countries They have to earmark a very large portion uh, or large funds for uh, their uh, connectivity projects in, in uh, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so, blue dot not good enough. Uh, so, I think that is the short answer. And uh, on the, in this of course in the court uh, summit i think there are uh, some of the uh, issues uh, regarding security uh, they are discussed but not revealed in that sense that they do, do not come out uh, come out in like a joint uh, statement and the joint statement is a very sanitized version and uh, all uh, points related to other than the security I mean, dialogue they come up uh, in, in, in this and communicate of the, but who uh, not uh, very meager, very little, uh, not much consequence. Um, or then that money India has given to Sri Lanka one six billion or so, but of course, so they they. they Anyway, it's a, it's a process, so it has started. So let's see how much uh, 
more uh, these powers can be that will be my answer. all right so we'll follow up this topic and so yes, and all of you if you want kartik please allow me to uh, finish it because i have very another 2 minutes i'm so very, uh, you'll have more chance and you'll have to go to vif website i'll share the link sure. there are a lot of very good papers you know very well balanced paper which you need to study and then come back to us and i take the liberty from brigadier sir being his student and being his uh, colleague that whenever you come to delhi or this part of india you can meet sir i can organize the meeting you can have a chat with cop on coffee with sir so please allow me to you know finish this we have one colleague from china he is a teacher professor at uh, uh, you know city what is your name of the university bibek can you please repeat uh, mr bibek you have hosted brigadier sir do you remember you have hosted me and brigadier sir and the whole delegation from vif bibek can you unmute yes yes sir namaskar sir sir i still remember okay so please share your views sir uh, uh, thank you sir so my question is how long will it take hypothetically to become the option against chinese hegemony in south asia yeah now that's a tough question i mean there is no straight answer to that question because as as long as uh, you see what, what, what spoils the whole show is uh, pakistan so given the dna of pakistan and its uh, uh, hostility to india i think uh, it uh, and because we also are want to be ready for any pakistan uh, uh, chinese collusion uh, Uh, and then their uh, war on two fronts. Uh, so here also, I wonder very much uh, if one can give any time limit or any time by what time India will be able to uh, exercise its uh, due uh, influence in in, in uh, South Asia. So that timeline is difficult to be forecast. but we can work for that because chinese work for a very very long plan of 50 years and 100 years so we can also work from that but that plan may not only be limited to either territorial integration so we have to find ways and means to do that but that will be very long but because of the nature of our polity which changes after every 5 years it's very difficult to make any long term plans yeah. even though we are uh, unified uh, in uh, uh, in in a way to teach pakistan a lesson but well that is it i don't know there is anything else i can say so thank you for all the diplomatic answers sir i mean you are from military background but you what a diplomat you have become i i respect you sir it's very balanced and and um, uh, we have one tv uh, another another military man i just forget his name sir baksi mr baksi and now we have sir you so as very totally two different personalities on china on different issues i think we would like to hear more from you sir whenever you have time you visit my store we have one more colleague chandan he just joined us chandan what is your question please very quick so uh, good evening sir uh, i'm chandan from uh, the ir department in university of mysore so my question is sir uh, if fully implemented the belt and road initiative uh, projects could increase trade between 1.7% and 6.2% for for the world increasing global real income by 0.7% to 2.9% sir uh, so it's a uh, it's world bank data sir uh, so my question is sir if the bri can actually increase employment improve infrastructure reduce costs of trade and increase real income why is it uh, facing so much resistance sir, on a global level Oh, it's the uh, practices which have been adopted by Chinese. Like I was uh, mentioning, uh, there is a lack of uh, transparency in uh, the uh, uh, terms of loan, uh, and then there are uh, always some uh, hidden agenda agendas behind uh, uh, these uh, loans or debts, uh, and 
if uh, all these uh, uh, loans uh, or projects they were open to uh, transparency or uh, competition and the other uh, uh, you see companies other than the chinese were also allowed uh, then perhaps uh, and the uh, and the requirement of the country where this pro these projects are being executed or the requirement of that population uh, at least the labor local labor has should be employed local uh, practices have to be uh, respected because the chinese go there with their own labor set up their own camp uh, start uh, living in exclusion uh, away from uh, the local population and then there is uh, all kind of resentment uh, and then there is also exploitation by chinese companies whether you look at uh, uh, some of these projects in uh, africa or like i was mentioning earlier in in, in kyrgyzstan they, the, the 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 government had to uh, uh, give a gold mine uh, for some of the uh, that's which Kyrgyzstan could not pay because it's a poor country. Uh, and therefore, uh, those are some of the issues, the Chinese uh, practices, which uh, uh, she raised all these kind of uh, objections to how the Chinese are giving loans, and how they are dealing with the elites, uh, corrupt elites, where the, some of these, uh, countries there are weak institutions and uh, they cannot uh, you see manage these debts those all kind of those uh, problems lead to uh, this kind of uh, some sort of a pushback against the, the chinese yes. so so finally you, you look at the mekong mekong delta there the, you see, there are problems uh, along the uh, river where, uh, even though Laos and Cambodia they are uh, supporting China, but in fact the dams which have been created on this Mekong River, they are creating at times droughts, at times uh, floods, the fisheries, the agriculture, all have been annihilated. So, and the, 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 the there is nothing which you know, those countries can do. The public. Uh, of course, in, in, in the normal republic, there is a resentment against the Chinese problems. A lot of kids, even in Africa. Sir, in this one and a half hour discussion, and now finally we have got our conclusion and most of the students and colleagues are scholars here. So without saying anything, sir, you have said everything. Uh, your knowledge today and your expertise today is uh, very old. And uh, I mean, we are not born when you started watching China. Even most of us were not born. And for the last three decades, you have been very active in uh, academics. And uh, today, what you shared on China's Belt and Road Initiative is so vast, so big, that all of us were not able to catch up all the points. So definitely, we look for a long-term association with you. And University of Mashore uh, is the first time inviting you, but their students would like to be guided by you, work under you. And as you have been one of the pattern of my institute, BRICS Institute, so um, it's an honor for me to introduce you to University of Mysore. And as tradition of this forum, Mysore Global Forum, I invite one of my young students to say, if, I mean, in, we are not able to thank you really in the gratitude, but as per tradition, I ask Saheli to say a few words, sir, to express our feeling from heart that we are how grateful we are that you took out time and spent with us one and a half hour. And you took so many questions, sir. Most of the questions were not well formed, not well informed but you patiently took them and, and directed them and replied them. So it was all mistake on my part that I was not, I have not done my homework and housekeeping. Uh, I beg your pardon and I give the uh, podium to Saheli. Saheli, would you like to express gratitude on behalf of our two institutions? And then Madam Bharti will do the closing ceremony. Saheli, the podium is yours. A very good evening to all. It's my pleasure to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of Mysore Global Forum. First and foremost, I thank Professor G. Hemant Kumar, sir, Vice Chancellor of University of Mysore, and Professor Anita Bimla Baggs, ma'am, Principal of Maharaja College, for their constant support. 
I take immense pleasure in extending my sincere thanks to our speaker, Brigadier Vinod Anand sir, who despite of his busy schedule has found time to grace this event. Sir is a senior fellow at the Vivekananda International Foundation, New Delhi. Earlier, he was a senior fellow at the Institute of for Defense Studies and Analysis. Also, he writes on military and strategic issues, including regional and international security. We are really very happy to have you, sir. Once again, thank you so much for being with us. I also like to express my heartfelt thanks to Professor Dr. T. Anant Padmanavan, sir, Director of School of Engineering, Mysore University, and Assistant Professor Dr. Janhavi S.S. Ma'am uh, from Karnataka State Open University for their valuable presence. A special thanks to Dr. Vinod Singh, sir, Director of BRICS Institute India, for his constant support and guidance. I also must give my gratitude to Dr. Bharti Hiramat Ma'am, Head and Coordinator of International Relations Department, for giving us this opportunity. A special thanks to Dr. S. Chandranayaka, sir, Coordinator of IOE, for helping us in many ways. Last but not the least, I would like to thank the teaching faculty of our department, dignitaries, scholars, and students who have joined this panel discussion, and also those who work behind the screen, especially Manjunathan sir, Renuka Hiramat, Milan, Shashank, PhD scholar Vijay Kumar NC, Sandil, and obviously the students of International Relations Department for making this event a successful one. Before ending, I'm very glad to announce that we have another panel discussion on politics of Sri Lanka's economic crisis, internal and external dimension next week. I hope all of you will join us on that day also. Once again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. And Bharti Madam, would you like to do the closing ceremony? Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Brigadier Vinod Anand, it is uh, uh, really uh, today, it's a great day for our student, for, especially for me. I enjoyed the classroom. I got to know the you know, economic investment, how China is destabilizing uh, you know, South Asian countries. And also moreover, as an academician, sir, I'm really very much interested in uh, China's uh, influence in uh, South Asia. Because as a India, of course, we have, have uh, you know, I am especially, personally, I'm very opt optimistic, sir. I hope India will be able to, uh, you know, control the influence of China in South Asia. Not, of course, from the, you know, not to become as in a hard power with its, uh, with the help of its uh, soft power, India can uh, control the influence of South Asia. With this optimistic hope, we will conclude today's discussion. Once again, sir, it is uh, immense pleasure to me to see you uh, in Mysore, sir. It's in a regular series of international panel discussion. We are expecting many more scholars and eminent persons like you people, sir, in upcoming days. Uh, thank you, sir, for this, Dr. Binod. I am really very uh, grateful to Dr. Binod, sir. Once again, thank you so much, sir, for everyone. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Brigadier, sir, once again for taking Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Look forward to see you. Thank you. Bharti, madam, thank you so much uh, to inviting experts from power sector. You know, we can have a discussion on power sector sometime. Yes. Yes, because sure. I had, sir. I had two rows power cut right now in Gurgaon. So I'm just holding on, you know, this backup. So, sir, mm -hmm. why not our technology from South can come to North? What is the divide in North and South? <laughs> Uh, sir, uh, you know, as we know, sir, India immediately when China started to emerge as a powerful nation in South Asia and when it started to enter into South Asia, then India immediately, I think, sir, it uh, wake up, uh, you know, now it got uh, uh, aware about that immediately. It completed uh, nine projects, sir, pending projects with uh, Nepal and Sri Lanka, and many more countries. I think it's a good lesson for India. Uh, India should, uh, you know, we should try to become, you know, we are not telling India is, of course, we are, uh, you know, great power in, uh, uh, in South Asia. But anyway, we should, we should look into this, sir, these issues, how India can overcome all this, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am.
thank you for bringing the all the experts and uh, hopefully next week we'll have something specific on sri lanka yes sir so please take care and uh, if you come to delhi let us know we'll have a good chat on coffee yes thank you sir thank you ma'am thank you